Uh, so we'll get started. So I'm hoping today that um, the goal, my learning outcomes or objectives for today are that you'll appreciate the value of a teaching portfolio because it is inherently valuable. Um, that you'll understand the difference between the components of a portfolio. Thank you, Judy. So we've got now we've got cups. Uh, that, yes, and Judy, if, if you could pour me a cup of hot water, that'd be fabulous. And I deeply appreciate that. All right, between the teaching philosophy, the teaching narrative, the appendices, and then really your archive of evidence, which you don't present, but you keep it, you keep there in case anybody wanted it. At least for the really formal teaching portfolio that you could submit for a tenure type of or promotion type of decision. And you'll understand how to you how the above or assemble, because that's what you really want to do, right? Into a compelling portrait of your teaching. And that you'll feel empowered to do it. You won't say, oh, I'll never be able to do this, but you'll say and say, yes, I can do that. Okay. So you'll have to let me know how I do on that. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh yeah, so this was for the people who were just showing up for questions, which I'm assuming all right, so why have one? Now, actually, you know, I look through the, pub, the policies. The provost says we should all have one, okay? And we should all have them all the time, right? And the reason is because it really is a tool for, re don't panic, most people don't assemble it until they actually <laughs> in the first time, but um, because it really is a tool to help us put our teaching on an upward trajectory instead of, you know, I, I'm pretty sure the first few years I kind of went around in circles, <laughs> right? Maybe if I was lucky, slightly spiraling, slightly higher each time. But, you know, with the idea being, it really is, thank you so much, Judy. Sorry about that extra work. Um, a tool that we can use to improve our teaching. So that's a fundamental reason. But, you know, there are other practical reasons that you probably have on the top of your brain um, now, right? Um, but it also can help you become a more critically reflective teacher. That's the real long-term reason why we do it, right? It also can be used to demonstrate your teaching effectiveness for a variety of measures. So we were just doing a little preliminary conversation with Karen. So, so Iris is probably thinking about promotion to full professor, right? I mean, that's the next step. Yeah, don't look so glum, I think it'd be great. Right? And, and, and uh, I'm gonna try to get this, uh, Shane. Yes. Shane is, 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 you know, next step is, look, is getting a permanent job, I guess. Maybe next step, sure. right? Yeah, uh, and then tell us, Karen, for you. I'm so you started, and yeah. now you're first. first thinking of your interim review, and then your promotion to associate professor. Perfect. Okay. And we've got a couple. Of, I'll shoot these down this way, and then just leave the empty stack that way. So toward the end, if, or if you'd evaluate it, that'd be great. All right. So, so this is a tool that can help other people assess your teaching, and you assess your teaching also, right? Now let's see what I got next. Uh, yeah. Now. One of the things that I was just talking about earlier today with other with departments was that your portfolio is one piece. Like we never want, we, 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 wa we want to hear th when we can three voices when we're evaluating a teacher or a course to success. We want to know what the instructor says themselves about the course, you know, what they're trying to achieve, how they're trying to achieve it, what students say about the course, and what, we, and what students do in the course. Kind of thing, and then what peers say. The, you know, especially the peers are become particularly important in more like the appropriateness of the content choices, level of things are taught. So, so ideally, we try to get those three voices, right? The teaching portfolio is your voice, right? And it's really where you get to say what your philosophy is, how you try to achieve these goals, and in some sense, walk people through what you've already done. And obviously it's going to vary. It's nice we kind of have really quite a spectrum of career points with us here. What exactly you can say, what you can actually say you have done already, is going to vary, right? And how big a document might be would also depend on whether or not it's, a, you know, for a job application or a teaching award document or one of those big, you know, almost the biggest hate site now, but, you know, is that one from assistant to associate? Because that's the one where you either, you know, well, actually you're looking for a job, pretty darn big too. <laughs> but you expect you should expect a lot of rejections. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? It takes, unless you're really lucky, there's a lot of, of you know, uh, resumes that or CVs that go out before you get the, the interview and all that. You know, it's, but it's not impossible. Like, look at all the success we've got. All right. Uh, okay. So the teaching portfolio or dossier, it's a collection of documents 
that support critical reflection, that's like on your part, or analysis, if it's someone else looking in, of a body of your teaching work. So, te and this is actually, oh man, I forgot to bring the book again. I have talked a lot of what I'm talking about, it, um, especially like sort of the theory, if you will, comes from Peter Selden's book called Teaching Portfolios. And I have copies of this book, and I'm happy to lend it out. But not so much that you would need it for the, um, that you would need to, not that so much that you'd need it for the, the theory that I'm telling you, because it's here, but the book, ha most of the book is examples. It probably has 50 or 60 examples of teaching portfolios from faculty across the discipline. Now, you never want to copy any of these, but you say, you know, when you're looking, especially trying to think of what's evidence of learning, you might say, oh, yeah, I, I could do that. You know, it's a great brainstorming type of operation. So I have copies of it, and you're welcome to borrow it, okay? So this quote comes from there. Teaching portfolios contain documents and materials which collectively suggest the scope and quality of a teacher's performance, right? And these are just sort of my little signs saying, you know, you don't want to, you don't want your teaching trajectory going down, you don't want to go around in circles. You really kind of, maybe with a couple of bumps, you know, you kind of want to try to move on an upward trajectory. That's what we hope having a critically reflective document will do for you. And believe me, we all have ups and downs, okay? So in the portfolio, you're going to have a state, you're going to state your teaching philosophy quite explicitly, right? And you're going to have, the teaching portfolio is going to have that teaching philosophy statement, and it's going to be a professional document that lists your major teaching accomplishments and provides evidence of your teaching effectiveness and your reflective approach. Really showing that, you know, when I first got started in the, um, being the director of the Center of Teaching and Learning, I tried to take a tr crash course pedagogy and things like that. One of the first articles that caught my eye was this distinction between just a, you know, an enthusiastic, charismatic type of teacher and an expert teacher. You know, someone who learned about the pedagogical theory and tried to implement it in their course, right? And, and that's really where you can maximize the learning. I mean, if you can combine them both, you know, yay. But, but it's that expert teaching that you're really trying to you know, you're trying to demonstrate in this reflective approach that you're professional about your teaching, right? And then you, you, so you put the evidence, you know, you don't just say, here's the evidence, dot, 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 okay? Well, management tends to, at the end, summarize your evidence in dot, 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 at least all the ones that I've seen. They tend to be, you know, very nice teaching dossiers, and then at the end, just to be on the safe side, they hit all the buttons in, in terms of a, a summary, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but for the most part, you're contextualizing it in the narrative, and you know, as the words suggest narrative, you're telling a story. You're telling, it's not fiction, but you're, t you're telling the true story. What do they call that, um, life writing, <laughs> sort of, you know? Uh, you're telling the truth, you know, you're trying to tell a story of your teaching, what your philosophy is, what your goals are, how you try to achieve them, how it's worked out in your course, how you're changing things to try to still get at those long-term goals that you have. And jump in anytime you have questions. Um, my, what I tend to do is I say it and say it again. Right? Now, I can't emphasize enough, it's a personal document that outlines your teaching goals and identifies the areas of success and areas for improvement, right? Some of the most powerful documents I've seen, the person, of course, they obviously have enough success that they got promoted, right? But they really talk frankly about the things they're still trying to achieve. What is still not working, right? Like, I'm still working on transferable skills. I can't get my students so far, like at least, you know, to really say, yeah, this course has really got a lot of transferable skills for them, right? So either I gotta build in more transferable skills or I gotta make the linkage better. But that's a side story. Um, I'm still definitely a work in progress, right? So, but it's, it, this is the one document that it really is you, right? There's no, most of the time if, a ch if you go to your chair and say, can you let me, can we take, can I take out some of the portfolios from the people who succeeded in our department? They're mostly gonna say no, because they don't want a cookie cutter approach. Right? You might say, well, you can come to my office and browse a few, you know, sort of just the same way I'm telling you about browsing this book, but they don't want there to be a standard form for a department because they recognize that different people have different strengths, different weaknesses, teach wildly different courses, right? So it really is something that is unique to you. And can be, you know, people can have really amazingly different philosophies, right, that still converge on great learning, right? Now, you're probably gonna see a couple of different numbers here, but a portfolio is typically about 20 pages, although, to tell you the truth, most of them are getting longer than that, but they can have appendices, right? Now, never for a job would you make it more than this, okay? Like for the job statement, stick with that 20 pages. But a lot of it can be in appendices. You really wanna be selective, okay? 
Um, the exact length is flexible and varies, it's going to vary with your discipline, your department, the length of the time period it covers, and the purpose of the portfolio. Like for, uh, when I went up for a promotion to full professor based on teaching, um, man, they wanted every course evaluation that was ever generated. And I've been here 28 years, so there was a lot of paper that was just involved with, with that, right? I mean, you know, there really was a sort of, it was a little, I mean, the tenure stream, so it was a little, I mean, a little bit different. I don't think they would want quite as much for a uh, promotion to a full professor teaching stream, but I'm not sure. But it really will depend exactly on the document, okay, the purpose of the portfolio as to its size. I think it's a good idea before, let's say, and this is so early, you don't have to worry about this yet, and because it might even be a different chair, who knows, right? But to talk to your chair, like in the year that you would be going forward, before you've really customized your portfolio for the particular purpose that it's being designed, to talk to your chair about what the what they what they would what their expectations are in terms of size, and and like a couple like whether or not it's going to be paper. A lot of it, I mean. The university really wants those high stakes decisions to actually be paper because they can't change. I mean, you have the paper and the paper stays the same piece of paper. They're this year rolling out a format where they will allow electronic ones, but they really want it to be done in a particular electronic way. Okay? But that doesn't mean the departments are necessarily going <laughs> to exactly toe the mark, but it's very much worth thinking about before you get really nuts and bolts what's the format going to be. We've had um, one of our instructors, um, Zora, who, a professor really, who went up for, to become associate professor, and she worked out something with CMS that they put hers on a secured um, web page, like it was a secured website, and so she did all, like, because she had like a, she had a digital magazine, and she had a lot of things that just were not paper, right? Um, and so they, they worked it out together and they did it that way. Some departments may still want to go paper, that doesn't mean you couldn't add some, if you had something that really benefited from being digital animations, you know, whatever, you could provide the links and people could go to them, right? But it's worth talking to your chair about before you go way down the line on it. And to talk about who's paying for the production of it, right? Because normally departments will defray all or, or good chunk of the productions of it. Like I had to produce 14 copies, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, so it's worth a conversation, right? It's not a time when you want to be pushy, <laughs> right? But you want to have a clear idea of what the expectations are going to be. Okay. So the teaching portfolio is going to be a combination of first person narrative. It's one of the, the academic documents that can say I. I believe. It's not something we would, you know, often be saying, but I believe, da da da, da you know, and therefore I do this. Right? I think this is the most important. So, so I is perfectly acceptable in a teaching portfolio, right? But so some of the perspectives are going to come from you, but you're also going to have teaching related documents. Some of, so in the narrative, it's you're, you're talking to the, to the people, right? You might very well be talking about I. Uh, but then you're going to include teaching related documents, some that you generate and some that are going to be generated by others, like it might be colleagues, but mostly students, right? You know, the most powerful things in a teaching portfolio are evidence of learning, right? And those are going to be most powerful when they're showing students learning, right? As opposed to saying, I think they learned a lot. Well, you know, what's the evidence you're providing that they learned a lot? Maybe you're looking at performance on, uh, you know, a test that hasn't changed a lot, that's in the normal realm from year to year, maybe it's success on a writing assignment, but some examples of student work is very powerful. You might have some things from colleagues, like if you had a formative visit, like if you just ask, you know, if you um, decided to meet with a colleague and reciprocally look at each other's classes, come to each other's classrooms, do peer observation, you might actually say, you know, here's what my colleagues told me when I invited, or a colleague told me when they came to my classroom in this year X, right? Um, and so based on that conversation, I've worked on these three things. So, so, so you may have some things from colleagues in there. Later on in the talk, I'm going to talk about there will be other information in there's really this and again, where I'm really talking about promotions and even interim reviews, not job applications. 
right? But in the teaching dossier, there's going to be the teaching portfolio, right? But there's also going to be a lot of other stuff, right? So there's going to be probably for um, teaching stream, there's going to be the external review of teaching, right? That's a teaching stream, right? I'm just going to call that teaching stream. And if it's a tenure, there's also going to be, if it's tenure, there's going to be, well, in both, there's going to be an internal teaching committee. Although our guidelines are kind of mild flux right now, okay, you know, with the creation of the new, um, new like, rank, uh, we were looking at our guidelines and we, and it's, right now it's going back and forth between Vice Provost and our um, Vice Dean Academic, which is Dr. Andrade, but uh, there's an in, probably going to be an internal teaching committee. Right, and then there's going to be like student and colleague letters. And there's going to be student surveys. And your internal teaching committee will do a classroom visit. They will probably look at all of the course evaluations that you've accumulated over time and analyze them, right? They'll also probably analyze the student surveys. They will not look at what the external reviewers say. That's an independent. So there's sort of so so that your teaching portfolio is part of a bigger file, of a much bigger file, right? But it's your chance to explain everything, right? Um, and I'll come back to this, circle back to this at the end. But you know, you like for example, in my course evaluations, not as much as it used to be, but it's still not nothing. But when I first started, virtually every student took the time to, to write. She writes. She talks about. 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 <laughs> Right, you know. Um, so I had to. So I knew that was out there, right? And uh, and and would probably be even nicer open to student surveys. Right? So I talked about that in my teaching portfolio. And actually, I had to evolve this whole thing. You know, the first thing I tried. So I said, you know, my students say I talk too fast. It's true. It is true, <laughs> right? So here's how I tried to fix it the first time, which was repeat myself. Because I'm talking so fast, they don't know I'm repeating myself. They think I'm saying something new, and they just have <laughs> twice as much notes to transcribe, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? So, so what I've slowly settled on is that I, I do more writing during the class, you know, like my oral activity, so so that I at least these nice pauses. Try to speak more slowly, which I have gotten a little better at, but it really slows it down if you have to write it, okay? So so I evolved that. So then when that shows up in this other part of my dossier, it's not just hanging out there where like I've ignored it and you know you know just. To, Play like that didn't happen and hope it wouldn't show up, it's gonna show up, right? So it's something to think about. You know, now on occasion, you know, you know, I had a student say, I wish you dressed better. <laughs> I'm ignoring that one, right? <laughs> you know, especially that's like an odd every now and then kind of comment, right? Um, but you know, if you consistently see something showing up in your course evaluations, that's you know, you would like to improve. It's probably better to talk about that in the portfolio. So so the people say, Oh, she's aware of that, he's aware of that. They're dealing with it. You know, we, none of us are perfect, but not just ignoring it. But there is a, an art to that, and if you have any questions about that as you go along, I'd be happy to, to, to talk about it, right? With you, whether well, not that one's worth, you know, exploring or not. But, but you'll want to kind of think about that. You can't know everything that's in there, but you do know the nice thing about course evaluations is you do know what the students are thinking. Because the other thing that they're doing with the student surveys, they're, they're kind of things to talk to them. Contacting students who have completed your course, right? And often several years ago. So that's nice, you know? The students often who in the course evaluation said, this course is too much work, <laughs> right? I don't know why we have to write this really annoying assignment on da da da. Three years later, they're saying, now I understand that that assignment has been so useful to me in my career, you know? So it's really nice. But anyway, so you, you can kind of. Be aware there are other components. And if you know of really positive or really negative ones, it's worth you know talking about in your portfolio. Okay. So long time on that one. Okay. Now this is not necessarily the order that you would include it, but the kinds of things that you want to have in your teaching portfolio is a statement of your teaching philosophy, which is probably the most formal-ish part of it, your teaching goals and interests, 
evidence of your professional development, and you really want to give that a very ongoing flavor, right? Not like, well, you know, for the first three years, I really went to a lot of workshops, now I'm finished. <laughs> you know, because maybe then you might be going to workshops and contributing after that. But um, summary of the course evaluations, you, your department should do the official summary table, and CTL is willing to produce those, right? Because it's a little bit third party. You know, like, we look at them, we create the table. Okay. But it doesn't mean you couldn't think of some you know, aspect that you, it doesn't mean you can't talk about it, right? And, and, and put something in that you'd like. I mean, for one example, would be we all get three formative questions, right? Like there's, where you get to choose three questions, right? No one sees those answers except you, unless you decide to, ch to share, which is what I like about it. It's like a, a no risk uh, thing. But if you wanted to talk about those, you could. Right? You'd have to provide the surveys because no one else, literally no one else can provide those surveys. I mean, I imagine we could go back to the company that does the course evaluations and get it, but it would not be trivially easy right, uh, to do. Or maybe you just want to talk about one component of the course evaluations that you've really been working on. Like, you know, for me, I guess that's a formative question that I have. I ask the students about the uh, transferable skills part of it. But there's other parts that I'm very mindful of. It says, did, did the professor create an atmosphere conducive to my learning. I really have been working on that one, right? So yeah, that's probably going to be in the departmental summary table. But if it's something that's really important to you, like if one of your major philosophies is that you really want to be building an atmosphere that's conducive to learning, you might highlight that question in it. So you might, the department should be creating a course evaluation table that's in that dossier, probably the external, I mean the internal teaching committee. But there's some parts of it you might want to highlight and talk about yourself. Right. And that's kind of at your discretion, right? Okay, uh, evident and, uh, and peer evaluation, that's if you've done any um, extra ones, right? Yes? Sorry, just to interject there, um, the summary of course evaluations is, when I finish this course, my, I haven't done this yet, that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. My uh, supervisor will go through all the course evaluations of my course and summarize it in a report, is that? No. No. Okay. So. Um, so you have like a zero, let's just say term to term, yeah. okay? So at the, en at the end of the term, the chair of your department yeah. will get the summary sheet of your course evaluations, okay? Which will we'll get the same one you get, except if you've selected three formative questions, he or she will not see that, okay? But they'll see your score for each question, right? And really, did we get that yet? We should be getting the... Uh, we already got it? I don't remember getting it. Ah, oh, I don't know if I picked my questions yet. No. I don't think we've gotten no, that no, yet. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. So time. within the next couple of weeks, we'll get an email from the system, <laughs> okay, that says, um, are you willing to share these results with students, I think? Do you want to opt out of sharing with students? As the student government puts it somewhere, okay. Um, you can't opt out of doing it, but opt out of sharing it with students. And would you like to select three questions? Okay, um, and those three questions no one will see. Students, the department head, only you will see the answer to those three. But your department head will otherwise get a copy of, of the same thing you get. At the end of the, well, I don't know, about a month later, at the end of the term, you'll get a PDF file that shows, it's a nice histogram of all the student, that, of the student responses to all of the questions, okay? They're just gonna put that in a file somewhere, okay? Um, but if it's your first time teaching, they'll probably look at it. To partly decide, you know, because if, you know, if it said really bad things, they might not rehire you, mm -hmm. right? But nowadays, they don't always get that before it's rehiring time. But they will get it, they will look at it, but they will probably just file it away, okay? But if you were teaching over and over, let's say you were teaching um, and you were going to be going up for promotion to session instructor two down the line. You know, then we would compile a table that had fall 2017, and what we usually do is pick the first five questions, plus there's an institutional composite mean, we would put that, right? And next, you know, on your evaluations, you'll see how your score compares to your departmental average and the campus average, right? And then we put those two things on the table, how it compares to the departmental and the institutional UTSC average, right? And we would do that for each course that you took. Right? But that's just the mean scores, right? But what you would see, and your chair could see, is the histogram of it, right? So, you know, if you had, 
a lot of scores in the four and fives, which is the high scores, right? And and but but a fair number in the one, like and three ones. So they might say, oh, those those people with the three ones got some kind of axe to grind. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna I'm gonna look more at well, how much of the pop. So it gives it's a more sophisticated look when you see the distribution of scores because it shows you whether or not they really are. Most faculty will say it's by model. It's not. I mean, if you actually look at the scores, there's really much more skewed over to the positive side. Right? It's not really, it's almost never equally distributed. But so, that, so you'll have a little bit more. But the table will only be those means and averages, right? If you, for some reason, wanted to bring it up and say, you know, this particular course this year was really funky, right? And you could see it was these two. And you say, this year I instituted uh, Turnitin plagiarism detective mechanism, and I had 15 students who were up, brought up on, on plagiarism. Um, that's an extreme example, right? But that could maybe skew it. And you explain, you'd have a chance to explain it. You might show the histogram, whereas we would otherwise, I think, is that me? Who am I daughter? Ha, ha, ha. Just, just... How would this make it go away? Put my phone on mute because I never remember to unmute it. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. That's what I don't tell students about. Their cell phones are just stare at them. <laughs> okay, uh, back on track. Uh, so that's of course. Did I answer the course evaluation? Yeah, part? I yeah. Have second part. Uh, yeah. So peer evaluations. Should I be inviting somebody to my lecture? I would say should is too strong a word. Okay. Could's not a bad idea. All right. right. Our best practices, and we're trying to move towards this more and more, is that you know. A new instructor gets a visit, right? You know that someone visits the person the first time they're teaching. You know, but some departments have incredibly, you know, it's 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 hard to do, right? But it would be nice if departments had a cadre of people that were trained to do it. If you ask CTL and you ask us with enough notice, we would probably either send someone or arrange someone. Like, a, like wasn't that long ago we had a request for someone from a computer science, a sessional instructor in computer science, and we actually got one of the you know, from the uh, keen sort of computer scientist who has a good relationship with us to actually go to that classroom, thinking that was a little bit more meaningful, right? But with enough notice, we could probably send someone from CTL or ask someone, we'd say, oh, would you rather have someone from your department and try to find someone to do it, right? It, it, it can be really helpful. Like, I, I went to one, uh, of one session, actually, I think about this, was a sessional instructor and sat in the back. It was about a 300 seat seater, and like he was using clickers. Okay. Students in multiple spots in the room had like a binder with five clickers. I don't know, you know what a clicker is? Like, you know, which is cheating, right? I mean, if they're doing it for, like, it, I mean, presumably they, they're not doing this just for grins. They're doing it because there's a mark associated with it, right? That's academic dishonesty, you know, and I, I don't think he was aware of it, right? And I, I, me, you know, I think we don't, we want, we want students to know right off the bat we're, we promote academic integrity and that's cheating. Right? Uh, if, if, it, if they don't mind if they consult with each other, then they should be saying they're not for points, right? And I mean, you can't be consulting with five clickers or anything, right? Because there's only one person there. It's different for them, five people deciding what they're going to click in, right? That's really quite different, right? So one example. The other thing was is that with all attempt to be inclusive, the person only looked at one part of the classroom. So it would be like if I looked the whole time at you, and he would ask for questions, and there's like all these hands going off on the other side of the room, right? You know, it's just some, when you're new at it, you just may not even catch that, right? So it's not about, it's a good, it's best practices. Let's put it that way. So should is too strong a term, but um, it's a good idea. And it's one we're starting to promote more and more, right? For example, in, like, I mean, I'm assuming you're aiming for a faculty position, but I'm just since you're in the sessional instructor kind of category, um, like even for promotion to sessional instructor two, where you have a little more job security, right? It has a classroom visit. And it's be nice to not have the first classroom visit be a high stakes one, right? It'd be nicer if it's collegial and you kind of think, wow, I got a lot out of that first classroom visit, you know, and so the next one seems kind of more like normal, right? So, yeah. So, is that the second part? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, evidence of service, you know, so I keep a diary, partly because, you know, I start thinking, where does my time go? <laughs> you know, I think, man, I'm getting inefficient. But then when I go back and look at the diary, I go, oh, well, no wonder I was busy. <laughs> you know, I was giving it. So I would tend to say, make some, keep a diary of what you're doing, right? Because it's, especially the more you're doing for your department, the more you lose track of what you're doing for your department, 
right? So I tend to, we you know, with the electronic catalog, I, I think about six codes, right? And I try to enter them in in codes on the dates, right? Uh, and then that way I can kind of chunk them later on. But do keep track of that. It's, it's important, and it's, it's service to teaching. And this is teaching, you know, kind of writ large. Right? Like if you go to a high school, like you're in environmental science, is that right? Yeah. I mean, you're going to a high school and talking about sustainability or environmental issues. Um, that's education, right? That's teaching, and you know, you presumably have identified yourself as a member of the University of Toronto community. It's we're benefiting from it. Um, the world is benefiting from it. So be sure to include those kinds of things too, right? Um, and then you're going to be wanting to include representative representative teaching materials. At a minimum, you want, I would say, to have your most recent syllabus for every course that you've taught, right? Um, you know, if you taught the same course multiple times, just give your most recent syllabus, right? Make sure it's the best one, too, <laughs> right? Um, and a sample lecture, I would say, or something that gives a, gives a sense of what your class would be like, right? And if you include PowerPoint slides, be sure to indicate whether or not they're yours. Right? Because you know most textbooks come with canned PowerPoint slides, right? And I'm not saying you can't use those, but most people, you know, most people would just might start there and then customize them, right? So you want to indicate how much you know, did you do these from scratch? Is this your customized version of the textbook ones? You know where you are on that, right? Um, assignment and a test, right? Um, from at least you know. Not necessarily the assignment and test from every course that you've ever taught, but you know, representative. You know, every, some people are going to have taught the same two courses forever uh, if they're in a research stream, but not always, right? Uh, the teaching stream may have taught. I don't know how many different courses you may have taught, uh, Iris, but you don't have to include, you know, materials from all of them. I would say more recent ones, right? For but would that be make sense to say I guess I'm teaching students and teaching so that last second thing? In, in the teaching stream, we tend to teach, you know, A, B, C, D, D. Next right, time, right. I'll be A, B, C, D. Yeah. yeah. But not all departments, yeah. right? I'm actually teaching our graduate class. Right. <laughs> so would that be make sense that the uh, representative teaching material for, you know, each level? That's what I would say. If you're yeah. teaching at each level, have a representative course at each level because the expectations would be different, right? Uh, and you would certainly want to make it clear if for, if for some reason you were doing all first year you want to, to know this is our first year. And definitely at the graduate level, you want people to know these are graduate students, right? And, the, and they're also going to hold you, you know, they're going to look at you slightly different way, at the course materials a different way if it's graduate students, right? So yeah, and I would say representative section of that, right? And even, you know, you guys do so much co-curricular, right? I mean, uh, so if you have, you know, rich co-curricular activities, I mean, I mean, I imagine different people, I just remember seeing George's, right? And he'd done a lot of co-curricular type of things. It, you know, then you want to include those too. Like, I mean, management is particularly tied pretty closely. I mean, it really blends pretty much. You know, there'll be a I don't know, finance course and then there'll be a finance competition or, you know, that really directly uses the skills from that course. And things. So, so think wide. I mean, you really want to think about your archive now, right? Collecting, it's really nice when you start early, collecting evidence of learning and think broadly, right? And write down everything you've done. When you actually do the portfolio, then you can afford to be very selective. You know, you, you'll have lots to choose from. All right. Okay, so the philosophy. The philosophy was really the hardest part for me. Right? And even, I, I've taken about eight philosophy courses, but <laughs> I never really thought about my philosophy of teaching until I actually was putting together a teaching portfolio. So, so what, what is this? So, all right, well, I would say, you know, the way I sort of deconstructed it so it wasn't that intimidating to me would be to think of it, you know, teaching philosophy is guided by an instructor's strengths and weaknesses and views on pedagogical principles, right? And really the, the practical thing is it's the principles and practices that guide your choices because we all have to make hard choices, right? I don't think any of us have enough money, enough of our students' time, enough TA time, enough of our own time to really mount the perfect course for all of our courses. Maybe every now and then we get privileged with teaching a fourth year course. But even then, getting the students time is a big challenge, right? So given the limitations of the whole system, what choices do you make? You know, if you know you've only got six hours a week of their time, how are you going to try to deploy it? Okay. So it's going to, and the, the plus to it is it's going to help you decide 
how to use your limited resources, resources to maximize learning within courses and programs. Right? You know, given you have X amount of time per course, right? How are you going to maximize learning? Because I really, you know, students, you, you do something and I say, oh, well, my other course gives me da 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 da. <laughs> well, did they give you this? Well, no. <laughs> you know, but they would, you know, students, you know, it's a human nature. We tend to like all of the resources that they ever saw that they ever liked. It's not possible, right? So we have to make choices. And I just have to explain to students. But I try to balance my weaknesses with my resources. If I know I talk too fast, I'm maybe going to, I'm, I'm going to give them um, some of my notes and feel pretty good about that, right? So it balances. All right. So, oops, did I the side? No. All right. All right, so just to kind of get things rolling a little bit, how about we just complete this sentence? I believe the most important role, and we don't have to share, we could share that side. But, you know, I believe the most important role of the teacher is to, right? Or a very important role, if that's less intimidating, because, you know, on the spot, what do you think is the most important thing? But what do you think is something that's a very important role of a teacher? Because this is the kind of thing you ask yourself when you're developing your philosophy. Okay. Anybody want to volunteer any? Who's already, yeah. I, I have a philosophy. All right. So I think what I wrote specifically, I can't quite remember. But, That's all right. This um, is more like just to kind of get the juices flowing. Well, so my philosophy is to basically foster, facilitate, environment that promotes independent learning. So that, okay, so, so you're that really students, you know right. you give them the tools and but right. they kind of do so the So really important thing for you is to create an environment that fosters independence. Right? Yeah. Okay, that, that's good, right? I mean that's fine. Okay. Right? And anybody I mean you don't have to, just yeah. I can share my I can well my thing is more able to apply in real life. So for me the important thing is that they can see the theory they learn in class how this related to the current event, what they see in the news. Ah, so, so authenticity, so that they can directly see why it would be important to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah another really good one, right? Yeah, my, my aim is usually to facilitate the environment of dialogue. Mm. So that students learn how to communicate effectively with one another, and you know, which also is necessary to learning. And yeah, so an environment that's sort of, because that's, of course, the social sciences seem to be embedded in this, right? But, but it's just challenged. It's, it seems to me the first couple of times in class when you're trying to get a meaningful dialogue going, this is not trivially easy, is it? Yeah, no, it's not, it's not nearly <laughs> as simple as I assumed it may be, especially yeah. in the current climate. This dialogue is a, is a challenge, but it's always a good first step before yeah. you know, going on. That was actually kind of interesting. I saw, I don't know if you guys, you're in anthropology, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I saw this interesting thing. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. I don't know if you guys, you're in anthropology, right? Yeah. Oh, no, that was sociology. Like that, that the social science, oh, it was <laughs> management students versus social science students, right? And, and I could be wrong on this, people listening on video, but, but on average, the, the social science students were less conservative than the management students. But less conservative? Yeah. So management students were more conservative on social issues. But still, it was kind of, I was proud of our Canadian responses. Uh, the students were still pretty liberal minded, considering the North American overall climate that, that was going on right now. But you can find yourself, sort of a sidetrack, but you can find yourself all of a sudden you think this is an easy discussion and all of a sudden you've got some very passionate uh, opinions that are, that are in your class that you maybe didn't realize that were there. Yeah. yeah. And actually, you know, one, this is a side story, but one instructor in French, she kind of learned the hard way. She had what she thought was an icebreaker, mm -hmm. right, about what part of the world, world the person was from and it was related to. She was assuming identity relative to geographical, and all of a sudden she had a polarized hot. <laughs> so what she started doing instead was, when she if she thought she had a hot button item, she would do a kind of a clicker question on the first, so that students could see the distribution of opinions in class before. Do you know what I'm talking about with these clickers? Yeah. You know, these little response devices, so so that they could see the range of opinions that were in the classroom and not just assume that everybody thought like that. But anyway, side story. Okay. Um, all right, so that's just kind of an icebreaker. So you guys actually don't look like you're, it's like, they were being a science geek. It was harder for me than it would be for you. We've already kind of covered this one, right? Um, but anyway, the, the philosophy is an articulation of your personal approach to teaching. So it's really more than just a philosophy, but it's your, it's how, it's your philosophy of how you're going to do your teaching, right? Um, so how you're going to approach your teaching. 
and it's typically not that long, right? Uh, two and a half pages is really on the outside. It's only in the humanities and social sciences that <laughs> you see uh, philosophies that are typically that long. I mean, it, nobody's going to nail you either way, right? But sometimes I've even seen half page ones, right? So, you know, one page is probably the norm for the, a formal philosophy part of it, right? Um, and then it kind of flows into the goals. And sometimes the longer ones are really at the back end of it. It's really more like the things that flow out of the person's philosophy. So I just had a couple of like things if you're having trouble with your philosophy. One's kind of fun, right? It's a survey, the teaching perspective inventories. You go to this link and you answer about 25 questions. And then it tells you kind of your dominant style, like whether or not you have a kind of the lecturer style or whether or not you have more of a apprentice style. So it has four different styles and the, it's kind of fun. But the nicest thing about it is, is that it also provides research articles. That's how you know, if this is your style, this is what's strong about that, and this is what the, date, the hazards of that style are, right? So, and it's kind of thought-provoking. I, I haven't done it in a while now, but for a while it was kind of fun. I, I would do it after I just taught my graduate course versus my first year course, and I'm like, it would really change, right? <laughs> you know, when I was thinking of it from that perspective, I think I had more of a lecture style, right, in the, the early course. So, it, so it's kind of fun anyway, it doesn't take very long. You know, another thing is just ask yourself some questions, right? So to, so to explore your own views. Things like, you know, well, and this is a good idea anyway, whom do you teach, right? Uh, especially new teachers have conflated, usually, <laughs> sense of everyone who's in my course is, you know, passionate about this subject, and which is still kind of a nice assumption, but, oh, but also has assumptions about what background they come in, what training they have, right? Which is very often not as complete as we would like, even because of the way we structured our prerequisites, right? So it's kind of a good idea to get a sense of who the students are teaching, you know, what year they mostly in, and even a show of hands in the first day of class, you know, how many of you, have, you know, have already taken any, depending on what you're teaching, but you know, how many environment, because like you even might be quite surprised at how many students have not, don't come from an environmental science background, right? And maybe not even a hard science background, right? And you want to know those kinds of things when you're getting started with, right? What's going to influence their learning, right? What might impede their learning? What, and especially after you've done it once or twice, you start to, it starts to unpack much better what's impeding their learning. And a lot of times it's their own assumptions, right? Um, and then you think about what's your role. Well, based on these things, what's your role, right? What's going to guide your teaching? So how do you see you helping putting out the fires is what I was over putting there, right? How do you see you help students getting overcoming their difficulties? So those are just some ideas there, right? So it's going to, basically your philosophy is going to guide your choices. And it's also going to frame the portfolio. Because out of your philosophy are going to come your goals, right? And then out of your goals are going to come your activities, right? And people are going to look at if they like your goals, right? And they're going to see how well you're doing at achieving them, right? So one of the big things, I'm not sure if I have a slide on it or not, is, um, alignment within your portfolio. Like if you say, it's very important to me that students can write well about the subject, then I'm gonna immediately be tempted to turn to the assignments and see what they were, right? And if there's no writing assignments, I'm gonna say, it's all talk, right? And I actually did encounter one like this, where the, the tests were entirely multiple choice. So where's the writing, right? They could appreciate writing, but you know, that's a pretty specific genre, <laughs> you know, right? So, you know, that's an extreme example that's easy to talk about. But it's really important to, you know, you can have your philosophy, right? And you can have these goals. But sometimes you have to say, in first year, like this with, you know, I, I have to, you know, be modest in this, my, the scope of my trying to accomplish those goals. Like, you know, my, one of my big things was I want students to think of themselves as scientists not people studying science, right? Move them into the activity. So I really would, you know, so they had, they had labs, and the labs were cookbook. Come in, uh, add this, add that, da da. You know, sometimes the technician had to do the middle step. So I really tried to get rid of that as much as possible, which is very hard. In the end, I had, it was like in a compromise situation with the technicians where, okay, the students get to control one variable. <laughs> <laughs> right? Everything else is standard. They get to pick either temperature, concentration. But amazing. That was an amazing amount of 
improvement. Because now all of a sudden the students aren't all saying the same thing. They have to be thinking about why did they pick that one? What, what was the consequences of that? So you know, that's a pretty modest goal, <laughs> right? But you know, so you have to kind of modify it based on what you're teaching too. Okay. All right, then you start moving on to more concrete things, right? To your goals. And sometimes you'll hear these things talked about as your claims. You know? you know, you have these goals for teaching, but really you're claiming that you're doing these things in your course. Right? And then you're gonna have to then you're gonna have to tell us how. But show you how your teaching practice flows from your philosophy and goals with concrete examples. Right? And then eventually you're gonna assess how well you're achieving those goals, what you're gonna to try to do to do better at achieving those goals, you know, what you've tried, what you're trying to do. We're, we're all a work in progress, so that's okay. Right? Alright, so now what it so we're gonna you have a philosophy, you have goals. You make claims. This is what I'm trying to accomplish in my courses. Now, what's the evidence, right? And what, so what do you need to be thinking about this? So um, you really want to take yourself out of yourself and think, if I was an evaluator and I, was and I saw someone making these kind of claims, what would be evidence that uh, that person was achieving it? So it really does help to step out of yourself and think about what would be evidence, right? And this is where you really want to start early, right? Collecting evidence. Right? <laughs> Anything that looks like learning, keep it. Right? <laughs> because it's much nicer if you just have a large collection, especially nowadays electronically. It's so easy to search for things, right? To code it in and, and anyway. So imagine yourself that you're the evaluator. What would you expect that person to be doing? Right? And how would you know if they actually did it well? So it's it's worth thinking of, right? This also kind of points to what your assignments might ought to be, right? Type <laughs> thing. So that's immediately where I start, and I almost can't help myself. Once the person is telling me what they're trying to achieve, I'm almost immediately turning to evidence, <laughs> trying to find the evidence of that. Now I'll go back and read the whole thing too, but I'm itching to find out, oh, what's, what's the evidence? Okay, so I think we'll just, we'll, we'll move on from this one. But it's basically it's just asking you to do that again. Right? You talked already about what important your goals were, right? Actually, so it's actually just a good idea. You guys each talked about, you know, an important goal. Now I'll go back and think about, okay, if somebody else told me that was their goal, what would I be looking for in terms of how they teach, what the assignments are, what the tests are, okay? Okay. So now it's just, just a different perspective. Sources of evidence to support your teaching could be materials from yourself, like an a cool assignment that you've designed, right? Um, a test that you've created that's showing the higher levels of learning that you're trying to get, right? Um, materials from others, and I think the others are usually, um, well, most often, I mean, this is, I mean, if it's peers, this is very limited here, but it's not impossible. In other words, if you had a peer observation that was not the peer observation, that's here, okay? Um, you know, someone else maybe said, you know, I tried that, that trick you had uh, of, I tried that kind of activity that you had in your class, and it really worked well in my class. That might be something that would be material for others. Products of learning. This is really powerful, right? So if you, you, if you had a student who was struggling with something, say, um, or you have some, some assignments that weren't collected, or you keep a few selectively, right? Uh, and you see how they've improved over the course of the class. It's not always possible, but these are very powerful, right? Or if you could show a typical, and we all, you know, a typical assignment from the first draft to a typical second, you know, final assignment, right? Same person would be more powerful, but even a typical, typical where you're trying to make a point, right, of improvement across it, or a, or the final part, like had an essay, a final essay that was was good. Yes. So. You would lift sit down for a minute. from the, uh, the assignment and put that in your portfolio? I would put that in my evidence box, and I might include it, yes. I think the answer is no, and I've yes. never been called on it. But this is, here's what I would say, and this actually points out to the differences in the files, okay? In the primary file, okay, you have a photocopy of that assignment, say. It's got the student's name on it, and it's got the whole thing unaltered, right? Then, if you wanted to include it, say, in an appendix or in your document, white out their name, right? But it would be quite clear. I mean, if you've done three of them, you need to be able to link them back. But you know, you don't keep that many, right? You know what I mean? You, as far as I have never actually had anyone 
ask for the primary files that I know of, right? But you would want to be able to produce it. So just you know that that to show that this really was a, a real student's assignment, right? But yeah, I think you, you don't need the students a, a permission to put a, sa a sample of student work in your portfolio if you don't identify them. So right? at the end of this semester, I should we have two papers that we'll be writing. Mm -hmm. So if I notice that the grades like left up from the midterm paper to the final paper, I should maybe take a sample of those two. Yeah, papers I don't. And Yes, and you know, like we had done uh, an intervention in first year biology. So we had lab reports, um, but they were, you know, pretty much this is the form we wanted to use, <laughs> okay? And then we would grade them, and then we had the grades. But when I say we would grade them, the TAs would grade them, okay? Um, but we weren't, like when I would spot check these, I wasn't that satisfied with it, and I you know, wasn't overly satisfied with the feedback the TAs were giving. So we decided to, you know, actually spend time in class talking about what we expected, because the students were doing things like, um, for our results, see figures one, two, three, and then they move on to the discussion, <laughs> you know, right? And they just had figures one, two, three with no analysis of them at all, right? So we actually, we had, I had, I mean, this was a class of course with a thousand, so just from the unclaimed reports, we had a lot of reports, right? So we had some reports that we kind of blinded. This is overkill for a regular time, but we, we looked at, you know, what the, what an, we looked at some A papers, right? And what some B papers looked like. Uh, and then we looked at some A and B papers in the other set. And we could really see that there was a lot more analysis of the results. For, for a B paper, there was a lot more analysis. But we also looked at the averages and it was interesting. The course average went up after we'd done this intervention, which was only part of the things that we did, right? But the grades on the lab reports actually went down. We thought the quality of the reports went up, even though the grades went down some. And I think that's because we also trained our TAs. Like, we actually trained the TAs and they were actually being more rigorous markers, right? So the grades in the course went up, yay. The grades in the lab reports actually went down a little, but the quality of the lab reports went way up. So that's a kind of a, I mean, that was actually a bigger study we did and we actually published the stuff. But for your part of it is, you know, you really might keep a few of those, right? And you might talk about it, right? You may not, it wouldn't be intimidated like you're going to be doing this whole thing and out. You may, you know, it's just not reasonable, right? To, at least not every course every time, type of thing, right? But yeah, so keep examples. You might not use them all, but so what? You know, it's okay to keep extras and then, you know, but if, it's nice to have a selection of things to come from. But you don't have, yeah, you can include student work as long as you anonymize it. But have a way to track it back to the original on the bizarre, you know, I shouldn't say bizarre, but on the I've never heard of yet scenario where someone asks you to prove it. Right. <laughs> right. Okay? Yeah. Have you looked at the subsequent year? We have never tracked the students through, which is what I would really like yeah. to do. Are they better in their lab reports, or even right? Just oh. track the student, even once you do the intervention, ah. Ah. in the next year there's new cohort. The mm -hmm. new right. thing. Yeah. Do you see the improvement? Because Does it I say? I'm trying to see in my first year yeah. with the little things. So true, they are not the same sample, but Yeah. I would say um, we only tracked we only did repeated it two times. I mean, in the end, we, this was a collaboration between CTL and biology, and CTL was actually going into the classroom and doing like about eight sessions, and it just wasn't sustainable. Like, we couldn't do that for biology and then do it again for sociology and anthropology. You know, we can't do it for all, we can't do it for any type of thing. Uh, what I'd really like to do is bring it back, but training the departments to do it themselves, to spend a little more time on the skill development type of thing, and maybe build resources for it. So, um, I, think, I think maybe if what you're getting at is could our heightened investment in an intervention actually be what's more important than the intervention itself, right? And I think that's certainly possible. Especially, I would say one of the take homes is every year you need to train your TAs. Even if they're 90% the same group, you need to reinvest the time in telling them what specifically to look for, not just assume, well, I told them that last year, this year they're going to do it again. They're busier this year. It's, you know, it's a fraction of them or a different cohort, right? And so it does take that same heightened investment to kind of keep it going. I think there probably is that kind of a, uh, an effect. But we did over several years um, show that the retention, one of the big pluses we had, and I don't want to go too far off topic, is we kept more, courses, more students in the course. Right? The course average went up a little, like a half letter grade, right? Um, A's didn't change <laughs> hardly at all. You know, students who are self-motivated 
there out there, right? But we really moved the D's into C's and the C's into B's a bit more, right? But the big win was students who didn't, like we had a greatly reduced number of students who dropped the course. By talking, by helping scaffolding it, we actually kept more of them thinking, yeah, they could succeed. And so that's particularly, given that we kept more students, the fact that we didn't lose ground on the GPA. So GPA and retention, we did look at multiple years, right? Compared to that original year, right? But um, we only did the writing analysis once because it was pretty intensive. You know, we had to blind them, right? You know, take off the identifier so that even the person evaluating them didn't know if this was the before or after type of thing. And, you know, to look at a meaningful sample of writings that way so it was kind of heavy. So we only did that once, right? And then another investigator one came back after the fact and said, you know, the percentage of males and females would impact your results, right? I mean, and, you know, it seemed to think that the, uh, I'm paraphrasing, and so it might not be accurate. So whoever's listening on the video, make sure this might not be accurate. But the way I remember it, because he was from Heckel, actually, right? He was saying, if you have a higher percentage of males, it's going to lower <laughs> results a little in terms of compliance with assignments. They're, they're going to be slightly more inclined to gain the assignment than, the, you know, especially in first year, because you know the. the Women tend to follow the rules more and, and do what they're asked. You know, now that's me paraphrasing him three years after he said it. So don't take that as the law. But you know, but he said you really need to be quantifying your male-female ratio every time you compare a sample. I don't know. Uh, I still don't know what to do with that information. Really. Right? Okay. All right. I'm fading fast. This is my fourth course of the week. All right. Uh, okay. So just other ideas, right? About be creative, right? And that's where this book, you know, I'm perfectly happy. I have multiple copies and I'm willing to lend them out. But I really need to get them back too, right? To, when you're ready, to, when you have two weeks, you know, like I lend it out for say two weeks, right? That's the wonderful thing about this book. You, you go through, you know, sort of let's say anthropology areas and you say, oh yeah, I do something like that. I should keep that. You know, it's a, or, oh, that's a good assignment. You know, it's a great idea generator and it shows you the kinds of things that people have kept and have used as evidence they're succeeding in generating learning. Okay. All right. So I think I. Right. So this is a little bit where I was kind of going from over here. So someone evaluating your teaching will use all three of the major sources your perspective and documents in the portfolio. They're going to have these independent student perspectives. They'll have your course evaluation tables. And really rich source is these student surveys, right? And the survey questions kind of feed directly to our. Uh, criteria for teaching effectiveness, right? Uh, and they're going to be triangulating. That's what we really are pitching with people who are evaluating teaching, that they look at all, they look at everything. So they, they look at what you're saying about your teaching. And it's amazing how with, when, you have, when you have strong teachers, these, the document just hums with you, like just resonates, you know? They're really, they, they are in tune with their students and you know, what the students are saying relates to what you know, they're doing. And even sometimes when a person has a problem spot, right, the students, are, you know, they pick that up and you can see it in, like, the, the course number, the course evaluation number, okay, it's only so reliable, right, because there really are ethnicity issues, uh, gender issues that can, can move something off an average, right? Um, but the student comments, you know, there are the outliers, but there's really valuable information in those. And, and often the, the faculty member is talking about the same thing the students are talking about, <laughs> you know, in terms of things, because they read their course evaluations, and that's good. That's a positive sign if a person knows what the students think could be better, right? Yeah? When you say that um, the evaluation numbers shift with gender and ethnicity, do you mean that in terms of how students identify with the instructor, or? Well, I mean, historically, sort of like on a global sense, right? White males get higher scores than uh, ethnic females with, you know, I don't know how you would ever say with identical content, but there's evidence that ethnicity and gender can have a factor, right? And regardless of who the audience is. <laughs> You know? I mean, it, it, we really have to work against the stereotypes, right? That doesn't, you know, so all that really means is that we should not, I don't think we should be making big, big distinctions between 4 and 3.9 you know, in his scores, right? Four and two, yeah. <laughs> that's a real difference, right? And, and that's the nice thing about the new system, it gives the histograms. So you can kind of see what's a mainstream student response, what, which is, you know, what the outlier. So we really need to go beyond just course evaluations, for sure, right? And not try to read 
overinterpret them to the last dec you know to the last decimal place. So I mean, we do look at the the um, you know the mean is provided, so it gives a bit of a reference point. And especially, it's interesting. Um, say the more math there is in the course, discount. <laughs> the course, you know, you know, it's gonna it's gonna tend to have a lower score. So like a department, like I'll just give an example that nobody's here. You like ACM, arts, culture, media, right? Most of humanities, mostly qualitative, right? They will have like a certain score for that designator. We can't see this as much as we used to with the old course evaluation, where we're st statistician analyzed it for linguistics, which has more quantitative aspects to it and numeracy, but within the humanities, those average all of the linguistic like the linguistic courses collectively have a lower average than the rest of the of the arts and culture arts culture and media type of things, right? So in I would I would be willing to bet if someone looked carefully at management's one, you know, like the behavioral versus the fi finance and economics, that you would probably on average see the more math ones are going to tend to be a little lower. But I only really could see, I mean, ha I have not looked at that. Because you can't really deconstruct that in most of the management types of things, right? Difficult. Yeah. But, but I mean, there are lots of things that are I guess my only real point is that there are things beyond the quality of the teaching that impact those scores yeah. that, that we can't control. And so we need to, fat, we need to be, that's why we have these three voices, you know, that we look at, right? And if a person has an accent, you know, <laughs> you have an accent, right? You know, you do your best, you know, you might think of, okay, I'm going to also give them my slides might have some more words on it, but, you know, and, and the, you know, the student with an, with, English as a second language may actually really have a harder time grappling with another person's accent unless it's exactly their same accent. But you know, accents are something we just cannot tell people they can't have. You know, what can you do about an accent, right? So all kinds of factors can come into it, right? And that's all I'm really saying there is that we do look at them, and I think we need to look at them, or else it's not meaningful. If we if we if we take if we let the students evaluate courses and we throw it in the trash can, it's not meaningful, right? And there really are voices there that should be heard, right? But we can't take it down to the last little number, right? We really need to look broadly at that, right? But it really is true. If someone's to consistently getting two, there's probably a problem with that course, right? So student evaluations are more numerical than they are like, based on comments. And, uh, yeah, there's like about eleven questions, okay, okay where the, where but where a student will give a score from one to five. Okay, and then they say, is there anything else you'd like to say about the course, <laughs> right? And then there's a second box that's something about the resources for the course, right? So there's two boxes where students can type in anything they would like to, to write, right? Um, and those, the nice thing about the new system is those are all nice, when you get your report, those are all nicely typed out, right? They're not linked to any of the histograms, right? You know what I mean? You just you get a histogram that shows the distribution of responses. How many people gave fives? How many people gave four? How many people gave three, two, one? Right? And then all of the comments. Right? Okay. So they will be triangulating, but that's why the portfolio is your chance to tell your story. Right? And again, it's different in a job application. Right? You know, um, if you get really good course evaluations, include them. <laughs> Right? If you just have one course evaluation from a campus that's so different, you know, if you're applying for a job at U of T, they'll know exactly what that course evaluation looks like, right? And it's probably valuable to include it. If you're applying someplace else that uses a wildly different kind of course evaluation system, it might not be that. Big. All right. Okay. All right, so just sort of you got, you go from your philosophy to your goals and your evidence, and these two together, the goals, evidence, storytelling, is part of the teaching narrative, right? And again, make sure you have alignment between your philosophy and your goals, even though you might have to modulate your goals depending on what you're teaching, and then be sure you have evidence to support the fact that you're achieving your goals. That's the biggest problem that I spot in the documents, is alignment. When the people ask me to look at this, that's usually also what I'm looking for. Okay, um, you wanna be, if, say, like a uh, job interview, you can't really do it, but for those who are going forward for promotion, I think you want to know what the guidelines are, right? I mean, so, and then you can, this is the link that shows what the UTSC guidelines are at the moment. All right, so what are the key attributes of your teaching portfolio? It provides a summary of your teaching responsibilities. I think that's very important because it's wildly different here at U of T. 
the kinds of roles that people have. State your teaching philosophy, narrate your teaching claims, provides key supporting evidence. Doesn't have to be every shred of evidence you've ever collected, key ones, indicates future directions, and make sure you've, you've had that conversation with your chair to know how you're going to have to duplicate it and distribute it and have it be read easily. The biggest problem I encountered doing these is that people talk about, you know, they'll refer me to page three of appendix one. If I accidentally go to appendix, two, I mean, if it's at all possible, I like to just number it absolutely from one to whatever, right? Because that's easier to find. If you happen to grab the wrong tab, you're, you're not where you need to be. To, you, know, you want to easily, when you refer people to other documents, like in an appendix, you want them to easily be able to find that information, all right? Remember, it's reflective and it's selective. And it is a place where less can sometimes be more, right? If you have four really strong claims and strong goals and you have good evidence for those, you don't want to dilute it with them with 20 really small things, you know, because they may forget then those four strong things. So it's an art to that, but you could put, you know, and other services in Appendix 3, <laughs> you know, that I, other ways that I've contributed in minor or more minor roles is in Appendix 3. You know, sometimes in that way you sometimes get the best of both worlds. All right, again, everything's contextualized. Don't put an appendix that you have not explained in the narrative, right? Make sure everything's referred to and made sense of. All right, All right. now this is actually more, not necessarily, but how a table of contents might actually look. One example, right? You might, I actually, that's what I did mine too. I wanted to do like a summary of my teaching responsibilities. So to give it a perspective on it. And at that time, I actually told a little bit about my students. Like at the time I did last one, you know, in most years I've taught first year biology. This is a large class with a thousand students, very diverse um, biology background. Additionally, a large number of English and second language learners a large number of first gen students, you know, whatever I happen to know about my cohort. I did have to actually look it up a little bit, but like Registrar's Office knows these kind of things, right? Then a uh, statement of teaching philosophy. I actually, you know, had a sec you might have sections on your methods that you're using, the strategies that you're using, your objective. It's getting a little, you know, you're getting concrete now. And then you're sort of walking them through your course materials. You'll have to decide how you're going to do this. This is kind of a literal no, no, no. one, right? That is a description of the course materials. Um, student ratings, but other people do, this is one, one possible way to organize it, and this is the rest of it, right? Evidence of student learning, self-peer mentor formative assessments, efforts you've made to improve your teaching, teaching awards and recognition, even being nominated for award is an honor, right? Someone put a lot of work into that. Uh, not everybody's going to have that, obviously. Uh, teaching goals for the future, both your short and your long-term long -term goals and your appendix. And it's especially important, I would say, in the assistant to associate professor section that, that the group has a sense of your trajectory for the future, right? For the promotion, you know, they've seen you long enough, they know you're, you're with it, you know, type of thing, all right? So that's one way to do it, but it's some people wildly more, it needs to have these elements in it, but whether or not you put them like this, or if you let a storyline, some people have organized it by goals, like this, you know, they talk about, um, writing critically is a major goal. And they will talk about all the things they do in their teaching across their courses to improve the writing. And then they may have a different goal, and then they'll talk about all the things that they do across their courses to achieve that goal. So, so it's up to you how you will do it. But I strongly recommend you give some perspective on like what's your responsibilities to begin with and, and your philosophy next. After that, it can be an obvious appendix in the last. All right. So how can you do this? Because I'm supposed to help you feel empowered, and, and Iris looks like she's unempowered at the moment. <laughs> no, just teasing, right? Yeah. So it's not, it's not that bad, but you really want to allow at least a few weeks for this, right? So this is what sort of Selden actually recommends. Just kind of for your own sake, summarize your teaching responsibilities. This could be bullet point, you know, this is not fancy, right? Then describe your approach to teaching. Then select things that you might put in your portfolio. What are some of the real good examples of things? And then think about what you would say about those items, right? So you could even think about these things being on the table, right? And then, then you might start to say, oh, that was not that great. And you know, kind of mentally collect those things, your evidence. In other words, this is a little bit of an evidence-based approach to it. Arrange them in an order. 
uh, collect your data, make your final selections, and then write a story, right? Write a logical narrative, weaving the evidence into a document, right? And then edit it, right? Especially if your views a pretty little or literal approach to begin with, take a break from it, maybe get a colleague to look at it, and then take a fresh look at it a week or two later if you have the time to do that, okay? Uh, a lot of times what people do with their appendices is they've described the highlights of what they want people to go to the appendices for in the narrative, but they kind of play it safe by putting some explanatory notes in the appendix itself. Like, you know, these are writing assignments from a particular course instead of just the writing assignments. They may put a little explanatory note. It might be, be very similar to what's in the narrative, but just at the front of it in case people have lost track of, of what they were doing there. Okay, and then create a nice table of content. A nice table of contents is a wonderful, wonderful tool for the person to easily help them navigate your document, okay? So around 20 pages should be the, the narrative itself. The appendices can be longer, and it's really in the appendices where you have your syllabi, your sample lecture, your activities, your assignments. You might take an excerpt from some of these assignments to actually put it in the narrative, but that's where the whole documents would be. Remember, everything should be mentioned and contextualized, right? Even if the evidence is actually in the appendix. All right. Make sure it's easy to find. And I think that's the end. Uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah. Actually, let me see where we are. It's all chance. Oh, yeah, we're almost. Oh, we've already covered this, so we're not too bad today. Okay. So the narrative is where you're going to put your analysis, your analysis, right? You might have some little table in there summarizing things, that would be in the narrative, but the appendix might be where you actually have your collection of teaching evaluation, right? And then the backup, well, this is another big example. In the old course evaluation, each student was on a sheet of paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> and in that, now those would be what would be in the archive, the summary sheet would be what might be in the appendix, and whatever you're trying to highlight in your narrative would be in your narrative. Okay, I think we've already talked about this. Start now, collecting your artifacts. Try to keep an accurate calendar. Know what criteria you're going to be judged by. Okay. And understand, and that was just understand how your portfolio fits in with the rest of the dossier. I think we've already covered that earlier. Just so that's what's on this slide. Oh. Yeah. I've already told you about this. This is a good book. I have copies of it. The library also has copies of it. Alright, so that's this document here. Is it a rare uh, book or can we uh, just order it for ourselves? And yeah, but you know, yes. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know, it might even just be 60 bucks, right? But it's not the kind of book you're going to go to, you know, like buy yourself a book, you're going to buy one book, buy something like Teaching at its Best. It's a how to teaching book. It's got a chapter on everything, right? But for this, Borrow. I would tend to say use it from the library. No offense to Peter, wherever you are. But, you know, right? It's just not a go-to kind of book, right? I would say borrow it, go to the library, check it out. They have it, it used to be they had it on short-term learn and long-term. I'm not quite sure if they kept it on short-term because I didn't keep asking them to do it, right? But they have copies and I'm perfectly happy. It's small enough that it's not that hard to put it in the campus mail and get it there, right? Just get it back to me. Okay. So I, I think we've already, I'm, I'm running out of gas. But basically, it's, I think what I've got here is mostly the same things that we talked about here. Remember that your portfolio is part of a bigger dossier. So it's your big chance to talk about what you want to talk about. Alright. Yeah, this is more of the kind of things that they have. I think this is the end of it. Yeah. So, this is maybe I'll try to see if there's may have some things in here that on here that are not in there. So the evidence that's going to be in your teaching portfolio, the, sorry, dossier that you're not going to provide, they're going to have a visit from your classroom by a colleague. There's going to the department should be summarizing your teacher evaluations. They will have surveys they sent to students independent of the course evaluation system for students who have completed the course, right? Um, if you have supervised any projects. And even for like the teaching stream, if you've worked, like if you've mentored a student for a competition or something like that, you know, you, it would be good to give the chair the names of those students so they could get letters from those students, I think. Because the letters, it's better if those, if those letters go to the chair, right, than, than, than you asking them for the letters and putting them in your, 
Anything you ask the students to provide you with is discounted, right? So we said, so we ask the student and we send it to the chair. I would, yeah, I would tell, I would send the names. You could ask the student, or you could just give the chair the list of names of students so they yeah, can contact them. Yeah, because I would do a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, well, I think it's good practice, right? Mm -hmm. if, if for those really rich uh, yeah, interactions to get yeah. different kind of feedback, right? You know, it's. I mean, sometimes those things will pop in, will show up on course evaluations, but not that often. Because, right? No, because a lot of times the way that we do our yeah, almost, the timing just doesn't MBA work that way. Right? Yeah. 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 Either include them in the survey or ask them for a letter type thing. I think would be reasonable to do. All right. Right. That's the, this one. Um, either. Oh, yeah. So, in other words, they're going to be looking at a whole uh, external teaching expert, which would be the teaching stream. Or I actually think now we're going to have an internal teaching committee for both anyway, at least for promotions of both. I'm not sure if we'll have the uh, for both. But so, it's just a kind of evidence. So, all right. I think we are. Yeah, so it's just, you know, why have it? So you can become a better, more expert teacher, to have a document that accurately accurately reflects your practice, and to help you get or keep, get, or keep, not keep, we don't really, we lost our keep, a job. Or just become a high, more highly prestigious professor. <laughs> so, so that completes it, but I'm happy to take questions or whatever. How do we do? Oh yeah, we got done. We got done. Oh yeah, plenty of time. Yeah. I'm just like you know where I'm at in my early stage. Of right. Career. So, what would you recommend to me in setting up a portfolio now? Like, where should I really focus my energies? Do I? Well, obviously on your philosophy and goals. Philosophy and goals. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, try to. I mean, I guess. I would do a retrospective on the, well, you're in the middle of your first course, right? I would definitely, at this point, I'd probably try to, there's only so much you can do to change your course. And, I mean, now it's pretty well set, right? And now you just have to let it roll out, right? So I would probably be, at, do a debrief at the end of this term. Are you teaching next term? No. Yeah, so perfect in some ways, right? And you have the, at your leisure, really think back on what went well and what didn't go well. Right? And if you were trying, it's not a bad idea to make the, try to say, if you were trying, well, if you're just trying to convince them to hire you again, if they said, why should I hire you again? Right? Imagine, and they said, give me a five page document on why I should hire you again. I mean, nobody's going to say it like that, right? But think about that, right? Like, what, you know, what worked well? I mean, I, we all tend to think about that way. What worked well? What could be better? But then now that you're moving forward, I would think it's at the, after you do your debrief, I think would be the time to be thinking about, well, you know, what is really important to me? Right? If, if I had the job already, what would be really important to me? About what do I think is really important in terms of me as an educator to be doing it? Because might as well think of the ideal situation. 